Hello, and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I am Beth Erickson. Our topic today is the spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania, and with us is Jacob Henry, spotted lanternfly operations manager with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Hello, Jacob, and thank you for joining us today. Hello, Beth. You're very welcome. I'm happy to be here. Well, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. So my name is Jacob Henry. I am the operations manager at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Um, I have a background in traditional forestry, landscape management, natural resources management. Um, I graduated from Purdue University in 2016 um, and moved out to Pennsylvania to work in the program. I've worked in several levels of the program, starting out in the field, um, working directly with, with and for against spotted lanternfly uh, in the field before moving up uh, through the various levels of our program. Um, we at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture are in charge of all operations for spotted lanternfly. That means treatment, control, survey, mitigation, all that kind of stuff. So uh, basically, if it involves killing, killing or finding spotted lanternfly, we have a hand in it. So this insect, that's the topic of today's program, is native to Asia and was first discovered in Pennsylvania in Berks County in 2014. How did the spotted lanternfly get here? It was a freak accident, really, as a lot of these things are. Um, there is a quarry in that area, and it just happens to come in with a single egg mass on a load of stone, and the rest is history. Wow. Well, let's get started so you can share more about this topic. If anyone in the audience has a question, please type it into the Q&A, and we will get to as many as we can after the presentation is complete. So Jacob, when you're ready, go right ahead. So again, I'm Jacob Henry, Spotted Lanternfly Program Operations Manager with the Department of Agriculture. Spotted Lanternfly, it's in Pennsylvania. What do we need to know about it? So Spotted Lanternfly, first of all, is a generalist. That means it can feed on a large variety of native, exotic, and ornamental trees that are found all across Pennsylvania. Uh, generalists are generally uh huh. Um, very difficult to control because they don't have any one specific place that they are found all the time. Um, as you'll see below, spotted lanternfly does have a primary host tree, which is Tree of Heaven, um, but they have been observed on many other species, including most common orchard species, most of the common uh, forest species in Pennsylvania, as well as many common ornamental species in Pennsylvania. Um, secondary species can include all species of maple, all species of birches, all wild and cultivated grapevines, multiflora rose and other cultivated roses, as well as black walnut. Um, all of these are very commonly found in all areas of forest all across Pennsylvania. So um, when you're seeing spotted lanternfly, um, this is all the life stages. So uh, as I mentioned, this first uh, point A here, that is an egg mass. Kind of looks like a little dab of caulk, um, a beige khaki brown, gray. Sometimes it can be white. Um, they can be found on virtually any surface, um, especially trees, but also on inorganic objects like trucks, houses, sheds. Um, we found it on pieces of styrofoam. Uh, out in the woods, on the undersides of pieces of sheet metal, um, all over the place. Um, generally, around the second to third week of May in any given year, um, we'll begin to hatch into uh, what you see there in section B. That is a first instar spotted lanternfly nymph. These nymphs will remain uh, with the black and white spots progressing through various sizes throughout uh, May and June. Towards the end of June and the beginning of July, we'll see a molting into uh, point C um, where they gain this red coloration. At that point, they should be around the size of a fingernail or a thumbnail. Um, and in another two weeks, um, it can be as early as the first week in July um, or as late as the middle of August, depending on when the egg mass is hatched. Uh, we'll see the molting into the full adults that you'll see swarming around in a lot of areas. Um, you can see D and E. Um, characteristic is that kind of uh, almost peach pink uh, 
wing with the spots. Um, you can see then with the wings open, uh, red wings with the black uh, sub wing tips. Um, that's generally going to be your uh, primary identifying factor for the adults. On some of the females, once they have uh, mated and are pregnant, uh, will gain uh, really obvious uh, yellow sides on their thorax, which is kind of the stomach area of the bug. And um, you'll be able to see those all over the place. Um, here are a couple of pictures of spotted lanternfly feeding. On the left, we have a picture of spotted lanternfly nymphs feeding on young tree of heaven. Um, you, generally, the, the nymphs tend to congregate on young, fresh green growth, as you can see in the image. Um, that's because their mouth parts generally are not strong enough to pierce uh, the harder, woodier flesh of more mature, mature trees. Um, and then here on the right, you can see a congregation of adult spotted lanternfly on Tree of Heaven. Um, and, you know, you'll see them in lower concentrations than this. You'll see them in higher concentrations than this. Um, this picture was taken in Berks County several years ago. And uh, as you can see, the levels are... I would say moderate for uh, what you would commonly see in an infested area in Pennsylvania. So we've talked a lot about spotted lanternfly, where it came from, but why is it even really a problem? So first and foremost, spotted lanternfly feeds heavily on wild and cultivated grape, grape vines, causing them to lose leaves, the ability to bear fruit, or even to die completely. Um, and that's a problem because grapevines can take up to three years to bear fruit once they're planted and can't be easily replaced. Um, it has a decimating effect on our wine industry um, and is a ma major economic factor. On top of that, spotted lanternfly also feed heavily on hops vines and the excretions that they make called honeydew can lay so heavily down on the fruit of the hops finds that it's completely unusable for any process related to human consumption. So if you've got a local brewery that you like and they have spotted lanternfly out there, they might not be able to brew your favorite beer uh, simply because these pests feed on them so much. Um, spotted lanternfly has also been shown to be a major stressor on trees. Um, just like the grapevines, it reduces their ability to produce sugars and other necessary nutrients. Um, we're especially concerned about this as Pennsylvania has a large orchard industry. Um, and on top of that, uh, honeydew, uh, that excretion that I mentioned earlier, builds up on surfaces, causes a growth of black sooty mold that's just really ugly and gross, and that can grow on any surface. And that mold, ladies and gentlemen, is the same type of mold that causes illness from black mold that you find in your house. So it's not exactly something that we want around our homes our children, or our places of business. So we know what it is. We know that it's a problem. What are me and my team doing about it? So first off, we have a quarantine in Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania has had this quarantine since 2014. Um, and this quarantine does several things. It allows for spotted lanternfly permit enforcement, which requires the checking of vehicles and equipment moving in and out of the quarantine in the state to make sure that they're not transporting spotted lanternfly. It allows us to control spotted lamp, control and manage spotted lanternfly across the state. It allows for funds to be freed up and used for research. And additionally, it allows other states to know that we are doing something to continue our trade relations with them, especially with other countries as well. So in 2023, we added these six new counties to our quarantine. Um, and I want you to know that when spotted lanternfly pops up in a county, we think ahead and we quarantine the entire county that enables us to do work whenever and wherever spotted lanternfly might pop up. So just because we uh, quarantined an entire county doesn't mean it's in the entire county. As you can see here, most of the time, it's only in a single one or two municipalities across an entire, an entire county um, that we're focusing our efforts on. So, you know, we have uh, more than 50 counties in the state are currently quarantined, but I want you to look at this map instead when you want to think about how far spotted lanternfly has spread in Pennsylvania. 
Less than 50% of municipalities in Pennsylvania are positive for spotted lanternfly. Our treatments, our, our treatment efforts are showing positive management, management results with uh, observances of reduced populations um, in certain areas that we've treated in. In terms of percentages, the new municipalities that we added in 2023 was the smallest increase in the history of spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania. And the only year with less quarantine municipalities overall was the first year that we found spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania. So there's still hope with this pest. Um, we are we're working very hard to control, um, and that is what we do. We control spotted lanternfly. We also we do surveys all across the state to make sure that we're finding uh, spotted lanternfly wherever it pops up. Um, in 2022, our staff completed almost 27,000 visual surveys all across the state. And as you can see, compared to that previous map, those surveys are heavily in areas where we don't know if spotted lanternfly is there or not, because it's our priority to find it in those areas. Of those vi almost 27,000 visual surveys, only around 20% of those points came up positive. So the vast majority of places that we're looking, we're not finding it. Um, so spotted lanternfly is present, but it is not pervasive across the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we also do circle trapping across the state of Pennsylvania. It's generally a companion tool to our visual survey methodology. Um, that'll serve a single site for an entire season. We generally use it for detecting population of spotted lanternfly early, um, but can also be used for anecdotal information on how dense a population is. So we um, you, we use these across entire areas of high priority air, uh, zones, um, and high priority zones can include warehouses, shipping areas, um, greenhouses, orchards, vineyards, all of those kinds of areas that we're really concerned about spotted lanternfly either causing an economic effect or spotted lanternfly being able to move somewhere else. We'll set up these traps um, and they'll be able to, um, we can check those and depending on how many, if any, spotted lanternfly we find in those traps, we can know how many spotted lanternfly are in an area in general, or if they're even there at all. And it provides us consistent sites that we can come back and perform visual surveys time after time after time after time during a season so that we can use our highly skilled staff to make sure that we're detecting any possible changes on those sites across the season that might indicate the presence of spotted lanternfly. In addition to survey, we do treat for spotted lanternfly. Um, these treatments can be a combination of several techniques. We will use systemic insecticides. Those are insecticides that are applied to a tree, only tree of heaven for spotted lanternfly, um, that will stay in the tree for up to three months, killing any spotted lanternfly that feed on it. We will use contact insecticides so that we can kill spotted lanternfly on non-alanthus vegetation. And we'll also use herbicide because removing Alanthus can ne negatively affect the uh, ability of spotted lanternfly to survive in some situations. Our treatments are prioritized to reduce the spread of spotted lanternfly. As I said, we manage and control spotted lanternfly. Um, Elimination um, is really hard to do. It's really hard to quantify. So we try to focus on reducing the spread of, pop of populations by controlling where they're at. Our management practices reduce damage to non-target insects, especially wild bees, birds, animals, and other native insects. Um, the last thing that we want to do is be going out and just spraying these harmful chemicals um, willy-nilly and damaging our native wildlife uh, that we're trying to save by eliminating a, a competitive pest from their environment. Um, we assess our treatment, re uh, treatment methods regularly, sometimes multiple times a year. Um, we have changed. I can't tell you the last time that we did not change our treatment methodology um, in the off season. Uh, we're always looking for the newest, most effective way uh, to kill spotted lanternfly while affecting um, our native habitats uh, the least. So what are some challenges that we face? As I mentioned earlier, spotted lanternfly feeds on a wide variety of host plants, both native and invasive. 
Um, because we're trying to reduce our effects of treatment on um, non-target native insects, we can't do our highly effective systemic treatments on anything but tree of heaven. Spotted lanternfly is the only thing that uses tree of heaven in Pennsylvania. And so we can target Alanthus and tree of heaven. Um, Alanthus is the scientific name for tree of heaven. Uh, we can target that knowing that we're gonna kill a lot of spotted lanternfly with minimal off-target effects. Um, now, um, in addition to that, spotted lanternfly can move long distance through the summer and fall. Um, I hear all over the place, uh, people say that spotted lanternfly cannot fly. That is not true. Spotted lanternfly may not be a strong flyer, but they can fly long distances, especially when helped by the wind. Um, spotted lanternfly can move thousands and thousands of feet during any given season from jumping from one tree to another and flying across distances um, um, between gaps, between buildings, between tree stands of trees, um, even across rivers in some locations. Um, and what this means is that we have to go back to high priority sites multiple times a year um, to, in order to effectively remove spotted lanternfly from those areas. Um, and it also means that we can't just treat a single property. Um, we have to treat an entire area in order to effectively manage spotted lanternfly because they're gonna, if we just treat a property once, we'll kill all the spotted lanternfly on that property, but then all the spotted lanternfly in the surrounding areas are gonna move back into that property um, and basically put us back at square one. Um, another thing, egg masses can be really hard to detect. Um, even the experts on our team can have a hard time finding them sometimes. Each egg mass can have up to 50 eggs of both uh, male and females. Eggs are laid on all surfaces, as I mentioned before. Like I said, we found it upside down on styrofoam sheets, on the bottoms of tree houses. They get laid on trucks. They get laid on trains. Um, you know, we haven't seen any um, evidence of it, but we're worried they could be laid on airplanes. Um, you know... And even when they are on trees, 90% of spotted lanternfly egg masses are found above 10 feet in the tree, which makes it really hard for us to reach from the ground. And we don't have a truly effective way of spraying an entirety of a tree and killing the egg masses in it. Because every way that we know of that can treat eggs also kills plants. So if our goal is to not damage our native plants and wildlife, um, we can't go around and spray those chemicals on our native plants. Um, we don't have a lure for this insect. You know, for some other species, there are lures that you can place in your traps that attract um, the insect. We don't have anything like that. So we're relying entirely on knowledge of the pest's habitat and knowledge of the ecology of different areas to place our traps. But that makes it a lot more difficult to find spotted lanternfly in these areas. There's a lot we flat out don't know. Um, the science has been moving very fast. We're very happy with that. But spotted lanternfly has really only been heavily researched for the last five to seven years. Um, and if anyone knows anything about research and science, they know that that's not enough time to find a final solution for anything like this. Um, we work heavily with our partners at Penn State with the USDA. Um, to help with research and other treatments. Um, but really the goal right now is to slow spotted lanternfly enough that we can allow the researchers to find us more and more effective solutions. Um, as a lot of you know, I'm sure, long distance transport is more common than ever. We're talking trains, trucks, ships, vehicles. I'm sure everyone is seen driving through their favorite uh, rural area, all these big warehouses going up all over the place. The more trucks, um, vehicles, and everything that are going through all these locations that are likely to have spotted lanternfly, the more areas that we have to treat, and the more, excuse me, <clears throat> and the more areas that are, make it possible for spotted lanternfly to move out of Pennsylvania's quarantine, out of Pennsylvania itself, and out, even out of the other states that, pencil, uh, that uh, spotted lanternfly has infested. And on top of that, habitat that supports spotted lanternfly is pen, plentiful across Pennsylvania and the United States. Um, Tree of Heaven thrives in heavily disturbed um, areas 
Um, heavily disturbed areas can be anywhere. They can be in, back in the middle of your 40 acres that your grandpa owns in the middle of nowhere. They can be behind your favorite grocery store, behind um, the movie theater, um, behind a warehouse, in a shipyard. They can be literally anywhere. And anywhere that those heavily disturbed areas are, you're likely to find Tree of Heaven, you're likely to find Spotted Lantern Fly. So what can you do about it, right? I'm not the only one here who can do something about Spotted Lantern Fly. If you see Spotted Lantern Fly, especially if you're in an area that's outside of the quarantine, please submit a public report. Um, that can be found at the agriculture.pa.gov website at the SLF report link, or you can call 1-888-4-BAD-FLY and report your sighting of spotted lanternfly. The other thing you can do, learn to identify Tree of Heaven. Our partners at Extension with Penn State have an entire guide um, on their website on how to identify Tree of Heaven compared to our other native wild, uh, wild plants that may look like it. But what if you have spotted lanternfly on your property? Me and my team are busy keeping spotted lanternfly from moving other areas. We may not be able to come out to your property and lay down a treatment, but you don't want spotted lanternfly there anyways. I would recommend contacting a licensed tree care professional in your area to come and treat your property. Any licensed tree care professional that's able to treat for emerald ash borer will be able to treat for spotted lanternfly. If you are inclined to do it yourself, I would recommend calling your local extension office um, and getting advice from them on what chemicals to use, what methodology to use, and where you should be applying your chemicals, and especially becoming informed of the risks that those chemicals may pose to you on your property. Um, again, my team are experts, and we know how to mitigate the, the risks for ourselves, our shareholders, and anyone on the properties um, that we uh, are treating. But again, it's important for you to be informed of those as well. On top of that, I highly, highly recommend reading the Spotted Lanternfly Management Guide for Homeowners located at Penn State Extension website at the link below, just extension.psu.edu slash spotted lanternfly management guide hyphens where there should be spaces. Um, there are plenty of things that you can do on your own to remove spotted lanternfly. Now, you may have a high infestation on your property. You may have a low infestation on your property but there's always something you can do. You may not be able to take care of it on your own, but someone will be able to help you with that. And I would highly recommend using the, the resources provided on this slide um, in order to, um, to exercise those. And that's really all that I have. So I'm now more than happy uh, to take some questions. We do have several questions for Jacob. Thank you so much for sharing that information. So the first one is, there were so many spotted lanternfly nymphs this time last year, and it seems like there are not many this year. Is that because of the efforts to control the population? Or does it have to do with weather? Are there changes, other changes that would make us see less? Are they, are they a little behind in their development this year? What's going yeah, on? That's a great question. Um, there are a lot of things that go into spotted lanternfly and when they show up in any given year. This year, they're definitely a little bit behind. Um, normally, we're starting to see our first four thin stars by this point, um, and we generally plan on seeing our first adults around the first week of July. I would say we're around two to three weeks behind that schedule this year, um, primarily due to that cold snap that we had in early May. Um, with all that rain that we had, um, that really set spotted lanternfly back. Spotted lanternfly rely heavily on uh, what are called degree days, which are days above a certain temperature. And for that two, two and a half week stretch, uh, the weather did not reach the required temperatures in order to advance spotted lanternfly's development. Um, now, in some areas, uh, it very well possibly could be um, our treatment methodologies. Um, we have been seeing reduced populations in areas that we've gone back to year after year, so we're very encouraged by that. But there are also areas that spotted lanternfly have just decreased overall, uh, and for no real apparent reason. Um, our partners at Penn State are working on researching that. Um, we don't really know what's causing it. The leading 
theory is that we're looking at a boom and bust cycle, very similar to the brown marmorated stink bug, where populations will be low some years and high other years. So you mentioned you change treatments uh, uh, between seasons. Um, is there any type of organic method that has been researched to get rid of the spotted lanternfly, or are there any naturally occurring predators that prey on the spotted lanternfly that could be used? There are naturally occurring predators that prey on spotted lanternfly in its native range in China. Um, we have researchers with the USDA and Penn State working on um, trying to find if any of those native predators would be appropriate to bring over to the United States. Uh, in order to reduce populations of spotted lanternfly. Um, as far as organic uh, solutions, uh, we're concerned about that as well. Um, so far as I know, the most um, quote unquote organic chemical product you're gonna find are gonna be your, your neem oils and your insecticidal soaps. Um, those are effective, uh, but generally have other side effects and are not truly organic. Um, but there is research ongoing into that, um, but um, we're not anticipating anything groundbreaking coming out uh, in the immediate future. So as the spotted lantern flies kind of move through Pennsylvania, are they also in the surrounding states in the Northeast? And also have they kind of spread to the West? Like where? What other states, countries are seeing this kind of infestation? Um, currently, there are, I believe, 12 states that have confirmed spotted lanternfly populations. Um, currently, they are all east of the Rockies. Um, I believe the furthest west state that has a confirmed population of spotted lanternfly is Illinois. Um, or no, not Illinois, Indiana. I'm sorry, Illinois does not have it yet. Um, and um, overall, our methodologies have been uh, pretty successful in reducing the spread, um, primarily by targeting those long distance transit hubs. Um, for countries, I don't know the true worldwide scope. I know it is considered an invasive pest in both Korea and Japan, um, but they have uh, more native insects that are more used to insects like spotted lanternfly. So pest uh, pest levels are not nearly as high in areas uh, like Japan or Korea. And that was another question. So it's a problem in, in our um, area because it's non-native. So does Asia have a problem with this insect at all, or do they have enough natural um, predators and enough conditions to control the population? I mean, there's a lot we don't know. Like I said, Spotted lanternfly was really only starting to be studied heavily uh, right after we found it in Pennsylvania and it was determined to be a pest. Um, I know it's considered an invasive pest in Korea and it is in Japan. I don't know to what level they're concerned about it, um, but given the fact that there was so little that we knew about it before that point in time, um, it's easy to guess that it was not considered a major pest in those areas, primarily due to um, the local native uh, predators that might feed on spotted lanternfly in those areas in order to keep populations low. One of the members of the audience mentioned that their chickens like to eat the spotted lanternfly, so I'm sure that's that could be helpful as well if you get enough. Absolutely, out there. <laughs> um, love to hear it. There was some talk earlier about milkweed being a deterrent for lanternflies. Is that something that's true or is that um, still something that's being studied? That is not true. I find spotted lanternfly on my milkweeds in my garden all the time. I find them on my milkweed more often than I find them on other things. Interesting, because I that was one I had heard and, and I agree with you. I saw them on my milkweed as well. So I think I thought that was not correct. Now I've also seen them on buildings. Will yes. these insects become, first off, why are they on buildings? And secondly, are they going to start coming into homes in the winter like the ladybugs and the stink bugs do? You do not need to worry about spotted lanternfly coming into your home. Spotted lanternfly die off completely every year, um, starting in late October into November. Spotted lanternfly do not exist in the environment through the winter. 
um, spotted lanternfly overwinter in their egg masses, and every year they hatch out a completely new generation of spotted lanternfly in the spring. So they will not come into your house in the winter. You do not need to be worried about that. Now, why they climb buildings? Again, that's another question we don't really have a solid answer to. Um, we know they like to climb tall things um, because they like to be able to jump off and have that assist to their flight. Um, we know that they're attracted to temperatures on the side of buildings can be warmer than the surrounding environment. Um, there's even some theories that they're attracted to certain vibrations that buildings and light poles have um, just from their native resonances. Um, but the fact of the matter is that you can and you will find them more often on those areas when there's a high population of spotted lanternfly nearby. So when you have a county that's under quarantine, how is that enforced? How do you stop it from moving outside of that area? Well, first and foremost, we have our operations team. We're the first line of defense uh, trying to prevent the growth of those populations of spotted lanternfly. But on top of that, we have an entire regulatory team uh, run by one of my colleagues in our office. Um, and their entire job is to go around and make sure that different businesses and um, uh, groups are adhering to our spotted lanternfly regulations. That is checking their vehicles, anytime they go in and out of the quarantine, making sure that uh, vehicles aren't stored with their doors open, uh, making sure that businesses, uh, truck drivers, and other organizations have their spotted lanternfly permit. Um, and they work on that year round. We have a staff that covers the entire state that works on that. So as we're looking and we're trying to um, be good stewards of the land and, and get rid of the lanternfly, when should we start looking for the eggs? You can look for the eggs at any time of year. Um, the eggs generally stay visible on trees and other surfaces for two to three years um, after they've been laid. Um, it takes some pretty heavy weathering for them to get worn away. Um, egg masses begin to be laid in the middle of October and early November. Um, so you can find them on surfaces throughout that point. Um, Egg masses can then be found throughout the entire winter up to the spring when they begin hatching again. So anywhere any you find egg masses is an area you're likely to find egg masses again, unless we've done heavy treatment in that area. That is a good tip. Now, if you're trying to figure out the difference between a sumac versus tree of heaven, um, any quick tips to know the difference to get rid of them? Yes, there are a handful of them. Um, first off, uh, sumac generally will have fuzzy leaves. Um, there are a couple of different species of sumac that we have here in Pennsylvania. Uh, most of them have that fuzzy coating on their leaves. Um, sumac will be completely serrated all along um, the edges of the leaf, which means it'll have lots of individual little indentations and teeth all around the lip of the leaf. Um, additionally, you can look for the fruiting bodies of uh, sumac. There'll be large cone-like uh, objects generally found at the ends of stalks um, or in between groups of uh, uh, flowers. Um, and they will be, uh, depending on the species, the most common species that we have uh, is smooth sumac in Pennsylvania. And they have big tufts of red buzzy fruit. Um, that kind of look like an upside down bunch of grapes. Um, so then going back to Alanthus, the leaves will be completely smooth except for one or two indentations on either side at the very base of the leaf, um, right next to where it comes out of the stem. Additionally, if you scrape the bark off or break the leaves, you're gonna get a smell that's very similar to, uh, we often call it rancid peanut butter. It's a really strong, characteristic smell that we don't really have from any of our other plants. So if you scrape it off and you smell it, you go, whoo, that's really gnarly. It's probably not sumac. Um, you know, and even compared to our native walnuts with also, which also look fairly similar, um, that smell is really going to be your dead giveaway. So there's a lot of great ways that people can get involved. Yes. In, in and I heavily recommend looking up that um, how to identify Alanthus 
uh, booklet from Penn State Extension. It goes over all those things that I just mentioned, plus a handful more. Fantastic. Now, not to add to more problems, but are there any other insects other than the lanternfly that are now a growing concern? Not at this point in time. Uh, my team is completely dedicated to spotted lanternfly, but if another insect pest does pop up, we are ready to um, respond. Fantastic. So thank you to everybody for your questions. Uh, Jacob, one last question for you. What would you like the audience to remember from today's program? If you see a spotted lanternfly, squash it. If you see a <laughs> spotted lanternfly, call in a report to us, and then squash it. <laughs> one, the only good spotted lanternfly is a dead spotted lanternfly, and every single one counts. And you know, it's hard because as adults, they are beautiful insects. Mm -hmm. They really have this gorgeous pattern to them. I've actually seen them in several pieces of art over the last couple of years that people have, have done. Um, one thing I have done, and I don't know if it's encouraged, but I was practicing my insect pinning and I was using lanternflies for that. Perfect. So I thought that was a great way to kind of Perfect. repurpose the lantern fly. So then you still get to admire their beauty and it's one less in the environment. Exactly. Oh, well, thank you, Jacob, so much for being part of this program today. You're very, very welcome. So to our audience, to explore more about this topic, please visit the um, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's website. And we ask that you would join us again for more Learn at Lunchtime programs. You can visit the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website to sign up for more program information.